listening to Bachi Talk FM, the podcast for facilities and workplace services professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and I'll be sitting down with our workplace industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the FM industry. Today's guest is Lucy James, uh, fellow Rex, Chartered Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management fellow, RSA, uh, and CAMTAP. Master of Intelligence Cantab. So uh, Lucy is one of the founding directors of Large Consulting, as you know, and is the managing director of the company. She has over 25 years experience in advising organizations on all aspects, FM strategy and delivery, and is considered one of the UK's experts in the field. She has led FM review and implementation programs for a wide range of well-known organizations from sectors including retail, leisure, finance, science, universities, local authorities, government departments, and charities. Well, she was part of the team that developed the workplace management framework. Lucy is a former board member of FMI UK, previously deputy chair of IWFM, and is a judge for the Technology in FM Awards. So she has been voted by her peer as the pioneer of FM and one of the top 20 most influential women in FM. She's a founder of the Women in FM Network and set up FM's first peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. Wow, that's so much to talk about there, Lucy. Welcome to Budget Talk FM. Great to have you with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Lizzie, let's go back to the very beginning. You know, where were you born? And let's talk about your high school and education. <clears throat> well, my childhood isn't isn't particularly interesting in a good way. I had a very ordinary upbringing, very happy family background. Um, my dad worked for local authorities, so um, when I was born, he happened to, my family happened to be living in Colchester. And then we moved to Margate, which is a seaside town in Kent. And we lived there while um, me and my sister were small. And then when my brother was born, we moved up north. And so I grew up really in Doncaster, mm -hmm. um, which is um, a big mining town in South Yorkshire. And when people ask me where I come from, that's generally what I say. That's where I feel like is home mm. because we moved around to quite a few places, but that's where I kind of went from being a child to being an adult. And that, that's the place that I think of when somebody says, where'd you come from? What's it, Lucy? So how was it growing up in Doncaster? Um, and any childhood memories? Coming? Yeah. I mean, I'm the oldest of um, three siblings. Um, my dad, comes from a very big family he's the youngest of seven brothers and he's um kind of worked his way up from a very humble background and ended up um in a kind of management role i wouldn't say rags to riches i'd say we went from um you know when we were when i was little we lived in a council house and we ended up having you know um, a nice home in Doncaster um, and um, we started going abroad on holiday when we got a little bit older and so we went to Spain and we went to France and um, my dad wanted to have adventures he's the kind of person um, in a restaurant he'll always have something on the menu that he hasn't tried before <laughs> and um, you know he he just he wanted to see the world he hadn't had the chance to travel. He didn't go to university. Um, and so he really kind of wanted all those opportunities for us. So he was very encouraging. But I think also we could see that he worked really hard. And that as he worked hard um, and he would be at work all day and then he would be marking exams in the evening. He, he marked exams for the Institute of um, Public Finance Accountants. And so he was always working in the evenings. But then gradually over time, it meant we could get a washing machine. And then when we moved to our next house, we could get a phone and I didn't have to share a bedroom with my sister. And so you kind of saw that relationship between working hard and improving your life. And I think um, when I was thinking about my family influences, I think that has really kind of stuck with me that mm. what you're supposed to do is work really hard for your family. And so I suppose that's that's kind of what I do. Um, and we have a little a family motto um, that came about when my brother was learning to ride his bike. And he uh, 
he kept falling off because he'd ride a little bit and then he'd stop and he'd fall off. And my dad was standing on the steps at the back of the house and just shouting, keep pedaling, keep pedaling. And that's kind of become what we say to each other in the family if we're struggling is we'll just kind of say, keep pedaling, um, you know, just kind of carry on with things. What a, what a, what a beautiful family and what a message from there, um, Lucy. So Doncaster, you did your schools and education there. And, uh, and what happened? Well, no, I mean, like during that age, did you manage to take any part-time roles or uh, what was your very first job? In the first college? Oh, wow. Do you know, I've had so many jobs when I was growing up, um, mostly waitressing jobs um, and then some cleaning jobs after university. Um, I worked at the bar at Doncaster Racecourse. Um, I worked in loads of different restaurants and cafes over time um, around where we lived. Um, and then in between, in the holidays at university, then I waitressed um, in hotels in town. Um, and then actually after I started work, I was struggling to make ends meet in my first and second job. And so I always had um, another job as well. Um, so I used to, when I first left university, I had a job in a marketing agency. Mm -hmm. And um, I also used to work as a cleaner before work and after work because um, it didn't pay very much to start with. Um, and then I think even when I went to work in London, I had another job then as well. I had my daytime job and then I used to go and work at another place some of the time in the evening just to kind of make ends meet. And I don't know, to me that wasn't unusual because um, lots of people had more than one job and would work at the weekend or would work in the evenings as well. And I think that there are a lot of the people that we have in FM are working like that as well so that somebody that's coming on shift as your kind of evening security guard has probably done another job during the daytime as well i think it's worth bearing in mind that while we're not paying a good living wage for those jobs then it, what that effectively means is that people have to have more than one job mm, wow Lucy. i mean like looking at the journey that you had uh, i mean like did you relocate from Doncaster while you were there, Lucy, or uh, was your work experience after university was all around Doncaster? How was oh, no. I mean, you couldn't really stay in Doncaster. Um, I was when I was at school, I was really braining. And probably one of I'm good at passing exams. And so I did really well at school. I went to a very ordinary school. It was a, a comprehensive school that had been a secondary modern school. So that would have been the kind of school you go to if you don't pass the 11 plus. But they'd made it into a comprehensive school. And um, so it was the first, it was quite recent that they, they had started to teach A-levels and send people to university. So because I was clever at school, the school really helped me to um, go to university and I, would, I got a place at Cambridge, at Pembroke College, which was, I suppose, a, a real achievement for the family because, you know, my parents didn't go to university. I think my dad would have loved to go to university, but he didn't. He didn't have that chance. And um, so the school was really encouraging. And I and nobody from the school had been to Oxford or Cambridge before either. So, but they really, really helped me to find out about the application process, um, get some contacts, and I got a place at Pembroke College in Cambridge. Um, it was the first time they'd ever accepted women. It's a very old college. Um, it was founded in 1347. And so it's very traditional. Um, there are lots of people where generation after generation have been to that college their father went, their grandfather went, all their brothers went. And so there were a small number of women in that first year. I think there was something like 28 women in the college. Um, and most of the people in that college came from top level private schools um, and knew lots of other people that were at Cambridge and had um, were very familiar with that kind of environment. 
which I wasn't at all. So it was a kind of strange experience because the women were in such a minority. And um, what hadn't really struck me is that most of the men at the college had applied to go to a single sex college. So they wanted to go to an all male college. So it was like being in a boys boarding school oh, wow. but with just a few girls. And I hadn't really even met anybody that had been to private school before I went to university. Um, there aren't schools like that in Doncaster. It's just not that kind of town. And when I went to university, it was in the middle of the miners' strike. Um, we had a miners' strike here in 1984. It was a huge strike. Um, it was very, very acrimonious between um, the miners and the government, between the miners and the police. So there was lots of fighting. There were lots of protests. We lived in a coal mining village outside Doncaster. And most of the village was houses that belonged to the coal board. So most of the families that lived in the village were coal miners. So it was a really difficult time for the town because there wasn't any strike pay. The miners were on strike for more than a year. So they were having to eat from soup kitchens. Um, we were coordinating donations from miners. Um, they were sending vans of food from our twin town in France, um, which was another mining town. Uh, miners were driving in vans from Poland to bring food for the miners in Doncaster. And all of this was happening, this kind of real social unrest and enormous poverty. Because of course, if you worked for the coal board, you got given your coal for your heating. So when you were on strike, you had no money and you had no heating. And the strike went on all through the winter. And it was a terrible, terrible time for the town. And in the middle of this, I went off to the most kind of prestigious university in the world and spent a term with all of these really wealthy, educated, posh people, and then came back home for Christmas and the miners were still on strike. Wow. I'm going to have to stop and blow my nose. I've got, hold on a second. <laughs> I'll just go and sort that. Let's go. I think um, for those of us that grew up during that period, um, it really made a big impression on us um, because it really kind of highlighted that there was this kind of divide. Um, and I think some of that kind of divide seems to have come back in the last few years around, um, you know, things like Brexit and some of the kind of talk that we've had about, um, the work of some other countries that we really rely on in the FM industry to do a lot of our operational work. And um, it wasn't a good time in the UK at all at that time. And um, when I came back in that Christmas holidays, I worked at the biggest hotel in the town in Doncaster as a waitress. And I went as a live-in waitress for the whole kind of Christmas week. And the hotel was mostly full of um, police from other areas that had come to police the miners' strike. And they were all being paid over time and they were staying in, you know, what was quite a fancy, quite a fancy posh hotel that was normally for people that were going to the races. And um, in evenings, um, when the picketing and the strikes had finished, then um, there were usually marches in the town, either for the miners or the miners' wives or the miners' children, to try and kind of raise the, the profile of what was happening. And all of these police that were staying in the hotel would lean out of the window of the hotel waving £10 notes at the miners because they were all on overtime. And it was a really made an impression on me about how difficult things could get in the UK, which we kind of think is quite a sort of civilized, um, integrated society. Um, it was a really, really horrible time. And it's taken the town a really long time to recover from that because so many of the shops shut down, um, you know, so many of the businesses closed down. There was a little parade of shops um, down at the end of the bit of the village where we lived. And one of the little shops was a guy that did football trophies and engraving trophies and things uh, because there used to be lots of sport between all the different teams. 
and all of that stopped and so his business closed down and there was another guy that did shoe repairs and he mainly did repairs for the miners for their boots and so he closed down and then there was a little bakery that managed to keep going but they normally did the kind of bread for the sandwiches for people to take for their lunch and so what happens when you have kind of that financial problem in a town where the main employer was the coal board and then none of those people had an income is that you cause an economic problem in a town that takes generations to recover from so if you look at my school now um the achievement rates are absolutely terrible it's one of the lowest achievement rates of schools in the country and that's because the children there now have had a generation where it's been really difficult to find work because all of the work in the town you know the majority of that was either in the mining industry or related to the mining industry and um, there are no coal mines left operating in the South Yorkshire coal field at all and I'm not sure there are any left in the UK um, the one in our village reopened for a while and when that closed that was the last deep coal mine to close in the UK so some of the people I was at school with have never really had a full career because if you stayed in Doncaster and this is an area where people have lived for generations and generations so lots of people don't want to move away because all of their family are there and all of their extended family are there and that's what they know and that's what they like and so it has been a really difficult time for the town so I um didn't go back and live there after I left university because I wouldn't have been able to get a job Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Lucy. So after successfully completing your university, um, how did you enter the FM world? Or was it an FM before or was it called an FM or how did you enter the FM? Enter? Well, most of the people who are um, my age in the FM area, I'm 55, um, most of us didn't start in FM. We ended up in it by a kind of accidental route. And I think there's a generation of people coming in now that begin their career by working in FM. But FM as a sector hadn't really kind of been identified as a career option, didn't really exist as something you would choose to do. So you ended up in it. Um, I, I studied languages at university. Um, I didn't do a technical subject. Um, I did modern languages. So I, I just spent my whole time reading 19th century novels and watching avant-garde plays and things and you might think well how on earth does that prepare you for a career in FM but I think any learning is never a waste and it did teach me how to write and develop an argument and to read and extract information and synthesize ideas and so all of those are skills that you would use in any career but they were particularly useful when I started working in FM because um a characteristic of a lot of people that work in FM, and I would say it's still the same today, is that they tend to be practical doers or people interactors. And so we're quite thin on the ground of people who like and enjoy and are good at writing. And that's how I ended up coming into it. I started working um, after university in a marketing agency. Um, I worked a lot with the drinks industry. Um, and the cigarette industry as well, in fact, um, quite a lot of work in the leisure industry. And then I moved to London and I started working in financial services. And bearing in mind, I had already been in this very male dominated environment at university. I then went to work in the city in financial printing. So it was printing industry, very male in the city, which was also very male before big bang um so lots of money washing around lots of long lunches very kind of blokey environment um very kind of hard working hard drinking culture and so when I came out of that into FM then I felt like I was very much at home in the FM industry as it was then with like loads of blokes working really hard and then playing really hard after work I think the culture of the FM industry has changed a lot but it was in a way, an advantage for me that I was comfortable 
in environments where there weren't very many women around because at the start of um, the FM profession, it tended to be a lot of engineers and technical people. And um, so it's taken us a long time to get more balance into the senior roles because you can't really recruit people into senior roles if they don't have the relevant experience. So you need to start by growing talent at the bottom so that you can pull it through up to the senior levels. So I started working in FM, I was working for the Crown Agents, um, which is a public sector procurement organisation that mainly um, procures goods and services for um, former colonies um, and developing countries and emerging nations. The Crown Agents used to be the organisation that ran the colonies when Britain was a colonial power. And so the Crown Agents now uses all of those skills to help newly independent nations or to help um, small nations that have never been colonies of the UK, but are small nations that need help with managing and developing their infrastructure. And I worked in the investment management team there. By this time, I was a, a fund manager um, running um, fixed interest funds. And I then, and I was doing all the marketing for the financial services as well. And then they said they were going to start a joint venture with a company called Simons and to move into this new area of facilities management. Local authorities were um, being obliged to go out to tender for their professional services and their operational services under this legislation called compulsory competitive tendering. And so Simons, who were a quantity surveying company, really, um, and Crown agents who had a lot of experience of providing services and, and running these procurement exercises, um, decided that if they got together, they would have a skill set that would mean that they would really be able to respond to this new requirement in the market. So this company called Simons FM was created and a lot of people that are now still working in the FM industry were part of that company. So um, Mike Kant, who um, started Larch with me, he was a part of that company. Oliver Jones was part of that company. Colin Hale, who started Mighty Cleaning, was part of that company. Um, Mike Ripper, um, Warren O'Leary. I'm trying to remember, there were loads of people that are still working in FM that all had this period of working um, at Simon's FM at Hain Street before it became part of General Dezo. Um, and then it became part of Dalkia. And then Dalkia was eaten by Mighty. Um, but a lot of the people right at the beginning were involved in this little company called Simon's Facilities Management. Um, and they had a spin-off that provided consultancy and outsourcing called Charter Services. Um, and Charter Services, which I worked in and Mike and Oliver worked in, um, won the first educational outsourced contract for a university. And then we won one with um, one of the big DSS contracts as well. So that was how I started in FM. And really I was in there to write the proposals and support with the marketing and the branding and that sort of thing. But what I realized is that um, when we were going in and doing the consultancy and looking at the advice, um, the reports that we were writing needed a lot of improving. So I started working on the reports as well. And by the time you've written a proposal, written the methodology, and then worked with the consultants to talk about the findings and write them into a report, it doesn't take very long before you think, I'm learning a lot about this. I'm mm -hmm. going to be able to start to do this as well. And then in uh, 1995, um, Mike and I uh, started Large, started our own advisory company um, because we just wanted to provide independent advice to people and where we were in the previous company we were giving people advice but also we were selling operational FM services and we felt that that was possibly a conflict of interest and um, what we really liked was doing the consultancy side of it so that's how we ended up starting large and so we're in our we'll be coming up to our 28th year in the spring 
Um, I never imagined I would work for that amount of time in the same company. But the beauty of being a consultant is that you see all sorts of different organisations. We were just having a look at this in the company and we did 20 projects last year. So that's like having 20 different jobs, 20 different sets of people that you work with, um, different organisations, different buildings, different teams. I've got a really low boredom threshold. And so consultancy is great for me because it means that I can, uh, you know, move through lots of different things in a week. And I, I that's what I enjoy. Perfect, Lucy. I mean, like what, what, a, what an entry to the FM world. So from, you know, from Simon's FM to large and from large to this, you know, as you rightly said, 28 years of working in large, you might have seen a lot of changes in the industry, Lucy. Um, in the way FM is procured, in the way FM is delivered, in the way, what we, how we define as FM. Talk us through about the evolution of FM from 1995 or from 1990s all the way to 2020s now. What did you see? Well, do you know, it's interesting because you would think that there would have been a tremendous transformation of an industry in that period. But some of the time I think, oh, you know, things haven't changed as much as you would have expected them to. And some things I think are kind of cyclical or patterns. So if you take something like the um, secondary education, when we were first working in um, large, there was this requirement, there was this opportunity for schools to become what was called grant maintained, where they could have their own funding, run their own show, they could get together in little groups if they wanted to, and therefore they could organise their FM services um, individually as schools, whereas previously it had been um, local education authorities. After a while, they stopped having grant maintained schools and it all went back to kind of central control through local education authorities um, in a similar way, um, although they were called something else by then. And now we have academy trusts, which are very similar, where, again, you can kind of have your funding separately. And it's kind of like the tide going out and coming in. And we've seen the same thing happening with um, the health sector where um, when we were first working in Larch, there were there was regional health authorities and NHS estates. And so all of the buying for health authorities on the FM side was done by region. And then it broke down into trusts, um, primary healthcare trusts and, um, you know, hospital trusts. Um, but now you see more grouped and consolidated buying by region and by group again so again that's the kind of ebb and flow of how they're buying their services um when we first started working in larch the property services agency was a government organization that ran all of the property for government departments in the uk and i can tell you because i can remember this it did not work well and it was a terrible level of service for people and everyone absolutely hated it but a lot of the people that are in these positions now don't remember what that was like and so we keep hearing discussions all the time about kind of movements to introduce something that sounds very like the property services agency and all of us that can remember it are thinking oh that didn't work very well before <laughs> so so we'll have to see i mean i suppose um the main change that we've seen in the public sector has been the introduction of the public procurement regulations. That was new legislation when we were starting out. And before that, um, the public sector would procure a lot of their contracts through, um, I mean, I always call it the big three, golf, Freemasonry and the Spearmint Rhino. You know, who did you know? Who were your mates? Um, and you would give them lots of work. And so it's an open opportunity now to win work with public sector bodies. And that is something that's been a big change. I think as far as commercial organisations are concerned, we've always had projects all the time while we've been supporting people in outsourcing where people have been either wanting to keep something in-house or bring it back in. So I don't think um, there has been that kind of inevitable move for everybody from in-house to TFM. You see a lot about the TFM model, that integrated single service provider, 
And you would imagine from the amount you see about it that that's the predominant model that everybody should be aspiring to in the UK. But in fact, it's probably still only about 10% of the overall UK market. Um, I think the reason that we read so much about it is that for FM service providers, that's the most efficient model for them. If you are an integrated FM provider, the more services you can provide for a client, the better it is for you. Um, arguably, it might be fantastic for them or it might not be. So at the moment, we've got situations where you've got these kind of global deals that the banks have with a single provider, like the Barclays ISS arrangement, for example. Um, and then you've got other organisations that are looking at very kind of bespoke individual services with best of breed providers and keeping some of those services in house. And we work with organisations right across that spectrum. And I think there isn't one thing that you could say is the best model because what suits a specific organization at a particular time isn't going to be right from one to the next so we've seen those banks with those integrated global fm deals but we also work with banks that have a combination of in-house and single service providers um location by location and they feel that provides a better level of service for them You're on mute. 28, 28 years of service, Lucy. You might have seen hundreds or the possible thousands of projects. Any memorable projects comes to your mind, Lucy, for all the reasons? Well, I there have been lots. We've had some fantastic clients. Um, you know, we've been really lucky. I, I love looking around an interesting building and finding out what makes organizations tick. And so I suppose. Some of the most interesting buildings that we've worked with would be people like the Natural History Museum and the Science Museum, um, particularly behind the scenes in those museums, the things that they have that are not inside the main collections, the things that are stored in other places. There's a room in the Natural History Museum that's full of big cabinets and they've got little thin drawers in them. And any drawer that you pull open is just full of butterflies and moths all pinned onto these boards. And there's something like, I can't remember, like 100,000 or a million or some, some incredible number of butterflies and moths just in this room. And so things like that are fascinating. But we've worked in nuclear power stations. Um, we've worked in um, brand new buildings like the... Barclays headquarters at Canary Wharf when that opened. We set up all of the FM for London City Hall when that opened. Um, we set up all the FM for the Bullring shopping centre when that opened. So we've done everything from kind of new buildings through to um, heritage buildings like the museums, like um, Compton Verney, a, a listed um, art gallery and museum in the countryside quite near to where I live that was going through a restoration of the chapel and has capability brown landscape grounds. Um, we did a big transformation program with Sainsbury's to um, create the company that is now called Arcus and that was developed um, through a piece of consultancy that Larch was doing um, and Steve Willis, who is a, a the one of the directors of Arcus, um, originally worked with us at Larch on that project. Um, we've worked with um, big brand names like um, companies in the drinks industry. We've worked with charities um, like uh, a women's refuge. Um, we've worked with um, a group of church schools. We've worked with um, a community centre in the middle of Leicester that was dealing with refugees. So we've we've tried to kind of span the whole side of it. We worked on a project in um, Saudi Arabia called the Princess Nora Hospital, which is, I think, the biggest hospital in the world. It has a railway to get around and it. it's absolutely enormous um, women's hospital and university. We worked on all of the FM infrastructure for the Pearl of the Gulf in Doha. Um, we've worked in, um, I know we've worked in on projects um, based in places like uh, Beirut. Um, but, and we've, we set up the FM last year for 
a new modern art museum in Shanghai, which we would have expected to go to to mobilise the whole team there. But because of COVID, we had to <laughs> shout it across Zoom, which was very disappointing. Um, but uh, Chris went out there um, just before China closed down. So I think that was our last international project for a while. But most of our work is in the UK. Um, we've worked with um, about um, half of the universities in the UK. We've worked with nearly all the London boroughs on projects for them. We've worked with lots of government departments and agencies. We've worked in defence, nuclear, uh, lots of work with hospitals. Mm. It's, it's really good to get the variety across the sectors. Okay, Lucy. Lucy, I'm just curious, why the name Large? Oh, well, before I worked in FM, as I said, I worked in marketing and branding and I'd worked in... Um, a few companies that had really complicated names um, and you would say the name of the company and people would say I'm oh, sorry um, <laughs> and um, and I've got a surname as you have where you tell people your name and then again they say what sorry how do you pronounce that how do you spell it and I thought you know what let's have a company name that is a simple name that is one syllable that it's typographically very neat I like the balance of the l at one end and the h at the other um, and so it's, um, it's because I worked in a printing company and um, worked a lot with typesetting and fonts, Larch is a nice word um, mm. to play around with um, in terms of fonts and typefaces. Um, it's short. If you have a name like Larch Consulting, people will abbreviate it to Larch. So they won't abbreviate it to something else. I think when I worked for Crown Agents Asset Management Limited, everyone abbreviated it to Camel. <laughs> um, which was you know and and it's that kind of thing where you just think okay you need a name that isn't like that um, <laughs> the larch the larch is quite an unusual tree it's the only deciduous conifer it's the most common tree across europe um i didn't know any of that when i thought about the name but we wanted a name that wasn't our surnames because we've both got absolutely terrible surnames that wouldn't really work well for a company name and um we thought that we didn't want something that said FM in it because we didn't know when we started the company how elastic that brand would be. And in fact, it's a good job that we're not called something facilities management because a lot of the work we do is around social value and procurement and working with um, developing the potential of SMEs. And that isn't really FM work. That comes out of our experience of the procurement side of the work that we do and how um, supply chains work. So a lot of our kind of supply chain consultancy and development work can still fit under that banner of large because we don't just do FM, but in the FM market, obviously that's that's what we're known for. Nice, 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 Lucy. So Lucy, I think in addition to being instrumental in the FM industry, advising, as you rightly said, public and private bodies, you also went ahead and played a massive role in um, IFMA UK, in IWFM, and also the founder of Women in FM. Talk us through why and uh, and the journey behind all these things, please. Yes, yeah, so I, um, by the time I started working in the FM industry, um, the BIFM had just been formed and I used to run a lot of training programs for them, and I still run training for on the um, IWFM qualification. But I worked with um, IWFM as a volunteer as soon as I got involved um, in Larch. It, for me, I think um, the profession has been really good to me, and so it's important to me to put something back in. So I've always volunteered with the professional organizations to support the profession that I work in. And, and I feel that everybody's got a responsibility to do that. But of course, if you work with any of these volunteer organizations, about 2% of the membership are active in running a volunteer run organization. And then there's about another 15% of people that will come along to things if someone else organizes them. And then you've got that rump of people that, you never kind of know whether they're dead or alive, pay their membership fees, don't ever really interact. So this is why you find that when you look at the FM profession, 
whichever bit of it you look at, whether you look at the trade associations we've had, the professional membership organisations we've got, other initiatives that we run, it's probably the same couple of hundred people that volunteer to do everything. And they just input where they can, which is why we all kind of seem as if we know each other because it's a relatively small pool of people compared to the whole of the profession. So I started volunteering for IWFM. I was on their um, learning committee to begin with when we were working on the first set of professional standards. Um, and then I moved over to chair the membership services committee that I'd been on for a while. Um, Sarah Hodge was on that with me as well. Um, I think Vicky Wooten was on it. I'm trying to remember who else was on it. Simon Ball was on it. It was chaired before me by Clive Hilton, who then mentored me as a chair when I took over. And, um, and if you are chairing one of the main committees as was, then you were also on the board. Um, and in the end, I became deputy chair um, when Mick Dalton was the chair. And I had a year as being deputy to Stan Mitchell and then a year um, deputy to Mick. Um, and during that period, um, women kept saying to me, because I was the only woman on the board at the time, there'd been another woman on the board and then her term had finished. And so then it was kind of just me. And um, people, women kept saying to me, do we have a women in FM network? And I said, well, no, we don't. And I looked at the membership statistics and the membership was... It was just under 20% female, which I thought was very low. But when you actually looked at how that broke down, and I don't know how it breaks down now, but at the time we had only three female fellows. And I know for a long time, the proportion of women fellows and women members, that next level down was nothing like 20%. And so the women members that we had were all at the, lower levels of entry and that it wasn't really reflecting senior women in the profession and there weren't very many women in senior roles at that time and, and I wasn't in a senior role and um, not many women were because the the big companies tended to be um have come out of kind of engineering and technical service organizations and so they already had a structure in them and that tended to be uh, men because they that was the sort of organizations that they were so it's important to emphasize that I don't think these organizations have actively discriminated against women but there weren't very many women to choose from so you can't select female candidates if if there aren't female candidates to meet the requirements of the post and we still see that in senior jobs that we're looking at now in FM that if you're looking for five to 10 years of senior level experience within a technical organization, for example, then there wouldn't be a 50-50 mix probably for that shortlist if you were looking at a particular set of experience. So we were talking about this as a professional institute and I said, well, you need to grow the talent from the bottom. And one of the things that we were noticing about um, BIFM events is that although we had 20% female membership, we certainly didn't have 20% female attendance at events. And there would very commonly be one, two, three women at an event. So we thought, well, how can we get more women to come to events? And how can we get more women to engage with the profession? And we felt that engaging with the membership institute was the way to engage with the profession. So I put an event on, um, which wasn't a Women in FM event. It was called Should We Have a Women in FM Network? And I invited Marilyn Stanley because she had been the chair of the um, BIFM and the first female chair. Um, and then because I was going to facilitate some workshops there um, and Marilyn was going to help me, I invited Anne to come and help me as well, Anne Lennox Martin, um, because she was one of the other three female fellows. And so... Um, I thought, well, they, people can see that there are senior women in FM then. They can look at Marilyn, they can look at Anne and see that there are women fellows of the Institute. You'll have heard that phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And so we had this event. It was really successful. 
there were lots of women that came to that event that have continued to remain involved in all the initiatives that we've done right from the beginning and that event I looked that up um, when I was preparing for this interview and I saw that it was in September 2004 was the first event that we ran and the Women in FM network has gone from strength to strength really um, it's open to everybody it's open to men as well of course and uh, lots of men go because you know lots of men work with women know women employ women you know <laughs> And the events have always been really good fun. Um, we realised that one of the um, one of the things that wasn't necessarily happening at some of the industry events was that um, if you didn't know anybody there, it could feel quite cliquey. So one of the things that I always made a part of a Women in FM network event, um, if I was running it, and I think this is still a characteristic now as Nikki's running it, is some kind of facilitated very gently facilitated networking so that for example you would know who was coming who hadn't been before and a committee member would make sure that they spoke to that person and introduce them to some other people so that people would come to an event and then they would feel comfortable and they would want to come to another one and that when they were feeling comfortable with coming to those events they would also have started to build up a network of people that they knew and then they would be able to feel more comfortable coming to all of the other events that were running as well so it was always intended to be a stream of events that would complement all of the rest of the events that were happening rather than take people away from them nice uh, Lizzie, I think I, I did attend one of your women in FM event. I mean, like it was it was absolutely amazing. I mean, like thank you and uh, continue to inspire. Uh, so what we are, and again with the my UK IWFM, I think there is a lot of support for the industry now. I think, um, but, but what have you seen in this past two years during COVID? How did the industry come together? Did you find any positive shout outs or anything that you'd like to share either within the women in FM or uh, slightly broader in the FM and, and we also saw you know 1300 plus FM colleagues lost their life it's the first time this has happened um you know any any thoughts around those things yeah I mean that those statistics around um the operational FM staff being at the kind of spearhead of um of the death toll was genuinely horrifying wasn't it but it's not the first time I've seen that, because if you look at what happened with 9-11, if you think about if there's an emergency in a building, who are the last people out? They're the fire wardens, the first aiders, the people who are trying to close off the power. Um, a lot of FM people were lost in 9-11. And I think um, that I'm not sure whether that has ever been formally added up. I saw some stuff about it on one of the anniversaries. But we just know who would be the last people out in our buildings. And we know that that would be our FM people. And we know that they would be looking after everyone else and making sure that everything was sorted and looking after people that couldn't get out themselves and that sort of thing. And so I think that um, we are the sort of people that need to be in the difficult situations but we kind of know that's how it is as well. Um, you know, people come into operational FM roles um, either because they have to, because it's the only work they can have, but very often because it's the work that they like. Mm -hmm. um, they like the hours because that fits in with their other commitments. They um, often like the fact that there is not a lot of responsibility and that we talk a lot about how to grow your career in FM. But one of the things we don't really talk about is that FM is also a good sector. If you want to have a job and get some money and that you don't want to be a manager and you don't want to build your career, then there are lots of opportunities to do a really good job that doesn't involve you having to climb a career ladder. And let's not forget that lots of people would actually like a job that fits in with other parts of their life as well. And I think perhaps we'll talk more about that in the future when people talk more about that that idea of work-life balance which only ever seems to apply to people who are trying to balance a glittering career with the rest of their life but you know what if you didn't want to have a glittering career what if you wanted to have a job and and do a really good thorough job of it and be 
the lady that runs the till at the workplace canteen and do that job for 25 years because then when you walk away at the end of the day you don't have any actions or stress to take away with you and you go home and enjoy time with your partner and your children you know that's okay as well isn't it 100 percent i think what you nailed is a super important point i think sometimes we do rush behind something just for the sake of running because of peer pressure but as you rightly said you know this is a beautiful point so before we wrap up part one, uh, Lucy, I think uh, we, we looked at your early career, uh, we looked at uh, how the Cambridge University and the mining strikes build the person who you are, Simon FM, large consulting, IWFM, Women in FM, if my UK, and uh, we talked about COVID as well. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting things there, but let's talk more about you in part two. So we wrap part one here, and we'll come back again in part two, we'll talk more about What's your hobbies and interests? What do you do in your pastime? What's 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 behind Lucy? Eh? The three things not many people know about you, etc. So let's um, take a minute break and we'll come back again. Yeah? Okay. So back to part two. In part one, we talked more about Lucy's professional career, early life, large consulting, and all the roles in the industry bodies. Now let's talk more about Lucy herself. So Lucy, talk us through three things not many people know about you. Um, well, I suppose it depends who we're talking about, because most of the people that know me outside work know that I'm um, a poet um, and a writer. Um, so I write for performance and I write for the page. Um, in fact, at the weekend, I had a, a new couple of poems out in an anthology and I was performing those at the Warwick Arts Centre. So that's um, that's my kind of outside of work interest. Um, having studied French at university, I... Um, I spend a lot of time in France. I bought a house there. I've been doing it up. Um, it's just about finished now. Um, big, big, bold FM project, you know, tore the whole place to pieces. Had uh, diggers inside the building digging up the floor and that sort of thing, because we we don't do things by half measures when we're doing projects in FM, do we? Just uh, gut the building and rip it to pieces. My neighbours, I think, were quite amazed, but uh, everyone likes it now. Um, I suppose if I hadn't become any of the things that I've become in my career, and I never really planned to become a consultant and, and have my own business at all, I, I certainly hadn't planned to run a consulting firm. And it's quite a difference. Lots of people that say, oh, I'd love to have my own business. Um, being a good consultant is not at all the same as running a consulting company. And I think lots of people kind of come adrift on that because they think, here's a thing that I know how to do. If you want to go out on your own as a business and do the thing that you can do, you have to be able to do the thing you can do. And you have to be able to build and run a company as well. And that is a whole separate skill set um, that if you start your own business and you haven't thought about that before, as we didn't, you have to kind of build the plane while the plane is in the sky. <laughs> totally. um, so that's that's been you know that's been fun um we have had some fantastic people work for us at large um and we're really proud of the things that people have gone on to do it's a really exciting thing to find people who are talented and develop them and build them up and that's something I've really loved doing in the company and also through the mentoring program that we've run in Women in FM. Um, I had another mentoring organisation called Sounding Board that mentored first offenders as part of the youth justice scheme. Um, I've been part of lots of social projects like the Education Business Partnership. We're running a project at the moment um, for Harrow Council where we mentor small companies to help them learn how to win work with the council. Um, we do lots of work around social value and all of that really is about identifying and nurturing talent. And that's something that lots of us are good at because we do that as parents. So we already have that skill in us. Translating it over into a work environment is one of the most rewarding and fun things that there is about being a boss, I think. Mm. Well said, Lucy, my God, you just... Uh... We're just quietly, you know, just passing by. You just said, no, I just played in Bobby Cards recently. I just wrote poems, etc. For many of us, it's like, wow. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> at some point we'll ask you to say, sing some songs or uh, play say some poems or do you have anything in mind right now that you wrote? um well i did quite a lot of online poetry courses in lockdown because there was more time to do it but um at the weekends that was the first live poetry event i think i've been at for the last couple of years so i suppose probably i need to focus on where I want to take it next this event that we were at at the weekend was all um about DNA and um, DNA stories it was called and it was um a kind of intersectionality of uh, the science of genetics and art and poetry so very very arty farty projects that is is quite far from what I'm doing in FM but it was a particular interest to me because um we have a genetic condition in our family that uh, my mum and my sister and I um, have, which is a, a, a blood disorder called um, congenital cytosis, which we don't really have any symptoms from. But my nephew um, has another um, genetic condition called Batten disease, uh, which um, comes on in infancy and uh, is a life limiting condition like motor neuron disease. And so my nephew and my mum are both on end of life care plans at the moment. And that is a kind of separate journey that, you know, you have to go on as a family while you're kind of doing all the work stuff and that sort of thing. And um, so that's going to take some of the time up this year, I think. In the lockdown, the thing that I really missed the most, I missed lots of things um, as we all did, but I really missed being able to spend time with my family because when you know that there are people that have a limited amount of time left and that then you can't really see them, that is difficult. Um, I think my mum is in a dementia care home and I've seen her face to face twice since Christmas 2019. Our prayers and thoughts uh, with you, uh, mom and uh, cousin dear uh, Lucy, stay strong. Um, well, I think I think everybody has things in their family mm. that are kind of sadnesses or difficulties that they need to deal with, and I think traditionally we haven't always spoken about that in a work environment because there's been a lot of pressure to be that career person. So somebody. Um, like Simone Fenton Jarvis, who would be a great person to interview for your podcast as the kind of, you know, new generation of people. She talks a lot about bringing your whole self to work. And I think for people of my age, we find that we know that that's a good idea, but we find it quite uncomfortable because we've had to present this really professional persona because it was difficult to be taken seriously as a woman. So I can remember when I was pregnant, I didn't want to tell any of my clients I was pregnant in case they thought that they wouldn't give me the follow on work because they think I might not come back. So I would try and arrange to get to the meetings before they did and then not stand up until after they'd left so that they wouldn't see that I had a baby bump. Mm -hmm. And I worked right up until the day that both of my daughters were due. And then I came back to work after a month with the first one and after six weeks with the second one, because I, there wasn't the um, opportunity to have the cover. And because I was running the business and there weren't many of us in the company, we, we needed to carry on doing the work. I wouldn't want to see women having to do that now because that was ridiculous. You know, it was really stressful and really difficult. And I think that parenting is part of that work-life balance that is a challenge for the men as well. I think in a really blokey industry like FM, um, parenting is for both of the parents, not just the mum, isn't it? And I think that we've created much more of a culture now where you can meet a couple of guys for a drink in the pub and they will be showing each other photographs of their kids. And I love that because I would never even mention to people that I had kids because it just wasn't, nobody ever talked about their families. It just wasn't a thing that you spoke about. Totally, Lucy. I think what a, what a, what a personal journey there. And uh, you, just, you just shared a very important point there. So last 10, 15 minutes, Lucy, let's just go to what we call rapid random fire questions around 
all random questions. Um, let's see. What's the one food you could never bring yourself to eat? Fennel. <laughs> Absolutely. The devil's work. Anything like fennel, aniseed, pasties, anything that tastes like that. Absolutely horrible. Close second, I'd say, would be marzipan. Okay, interesting. So what's your favourite food then? What You're happy to eat it every meal? And Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> That's always in my shopping trolley. Got it, got it. What will you do if you have a time machine? Oh, that's a great question, isn't it? Um, do you know, there are so many things I'd like to do if I had a time machine. But I think one of the things I'd like to do is to um, go back to 19th century France, because I spent so much of my degree reading 19th century novels. And where my house is in France now, in a little village in Brittany, it's almost still like the 19th century there. So if I want to chat to somebody in the village where they're talking about, I don't know, arranging a funeral, doing the next set of planting for the next set of crops, doing something with their cows, doing something at the church, I am absolutely on top of that conversation. But when I was trying to do things like get a router for my internet, I don't have the vocabulary for that. Because I, my 21st century vocabulary is very poor. So I think I would be really good at being in the 19th century. And I'd be really fascinated to see that. But if I had a time machine, I would be thrilled. I would be all over the world. I'd be at all of the events. I'd be going behind the scenes in all of those places mm. where you know that there were women, but they've never been documented. And think, what were they doing? So if you look at authors like Natalie Haynes, who is telling the stories of the women in the Greek myths, who might just have three lines in a play or just a short mention in a book and thinking they had all of their stories. Or another friend of mine who's doing a poetry PhD about the women of Hadrian's Wall. We know that there were women up there with the Roman legions because there are bits of stuff that they left, brooches and hair clips and things like that. But there's nothing about them. So what's their story? Mm. And it would be great to go back and find all of these stories. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. What a, I'm glad that they asked you the question. <laughs> so what song do you sing along only when you're alone? What memory does it bring? Oh, well, uh, music is everything to me. So every moment of my life has a soundtrack. Uh, we've always got music on in the house. We're a really musical family. I grew up in a really musical family. My dad was a chorister and was going to sing at the coronation and then his voice broke. Um, and so he didn't. But he always ran choirs. So I like um, I like English choral music. Um which I'm not really a going to church person, but I like church music. Um, uh, I listen to bands and go and see bands all the time, um, go to festivals, um, took the kids to Glastonbury when they were four and five. So they love going to see bands as well. That's another thing I've really missed in the lockdown is live music. Um, I used to sing in a band when I was at university. I was terrible. Um, and then I used to manage the band and I was good at that. So I was good at bossing everyone else around. Um, and so I've got hundreds of songs that are, I've got a song on from the moment I get up until the moment I go to bed is always music on. But if I had to have one song that would always make me dance and always make me smile, it would be the B-52's Love Shack. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's fine. Yes. So I know you, you're building a new place in Brittany. So, but if you could visit a place in the world right now, other than your home now and Brittany there, which place would you like to go to and why? Uh, if there was anywhere at all I could go to at the moment, I would go and see my mum mm. um, because her care home is on a lockdown again now because they've got COVID in the home. And so what would be really nice would be to go and sit with her without having to have a mask on, without her having to be in the kind of weird drafty visitor's room and just kind of sit and hang out with her. I mean, she's got dementia, so she wouldn't really know who I was or, um, you know, but we would still have a nice chat because she likes to have a chat. And I think that um, that sort of time is really precious. And one of the things I say to my daughters, um, my daughters are 21 and 23. And when I was their age, I was absolutely 
horrible to my mum. I was not a, I don't think I was a good daughter at that age. I was very frustrated with everything. I was rotten to my parents, but particularly my mum. And I mean, I, you know, I hope I've kind of made amends with them now. I mean, I have a good relationship with them now, but I was really horrible to my mum when I was younger, like really mean and unkind and rude and did lots of things that she disapproved of and that were not safe, really. And I, I really wish I hadn't done that now. And so when I say to the girls, don't do this because you'll really regret it later. I know they think I'm just saying that because I want them to behave differently. But you don't really understand until you get to a point where you're about to lose a parent that you think, oh, there was a lot of time where we could have got on better and that I was just rotten to her. Mm. Because I was just, I don't know, just mm. I think it's something girls and their mums, I don't know. I was horrible. I think in hindsight, you know, you know, we all have that some sort of stories like that, but but I'm sure she could feel what you feel now. Currently, Lucy, for a long interest to go and meet her. And as you mentioned, you know, our prayers and our thoughts will always be with you. So what's something that you have that you consider of most sentimental value at the moment, Lucy? Oh, that's a good question. Um, when I got divorced, I had to get rid of a lot of my things and I had to obviously share out a lot of things that we had together so I I couldn't kind of keep all of the things that I had thought were mine mm -hmm. and I had to reduce my life a lot in terms of the things that I had and it really made me think a lot about that and I thought you know the best things in life aren't things mm -hmm. and the memories are in me not in the things so probably the things that I would have of most sentimental value, if I was kind of running out of the house in a fire, I always used to say that it would be the family photo albums. And now I've got all of those backed up, so I don't have to panic so much about that anymore. But I've got this um, glass. It's a kind of vase. It's like a bowl with a boy sitting on a dolphin made of green glass. Now, I think if you just saw this, you'd think that is hideous, but it belongs to my granny. And it was my mum's favorite thing when she was little. And then I really liked it when I used to see it at my granny's house. And now I have this bowl in my house and it's not valuable. Um, it's, there's a little piece broken on it. And I think objectively, it's possibly a really ugly thing. But it's something that has kind of mattered to the people that have mattered to me. So I would probably take that glass dish, mm. even though it would be of no use to anyone. And it's probably not even a beautiful thing, but I like it. It's a personal thing and, and it's uh, the history behind it. Why not? Why not? So um, thank you for sharing that. And who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? Um, in my life, I would say probably my children, um, because I think that um, when you become a parent, then you learn a lot of new things about yourself. Um, you learn a lot about your shortcomings and you learn a lot about your strengths. And I think we're so lucky as women, because once you're a parent, you know, whatever else you're doing with your life, you can think I've grown a whole human being inside me. I've made a person and that is like a superpower. Mm -hmm. And that every kind or funny or smart or amazing thing that your children do, you think I made them. <laughs> um, so it just kind of makes you feel really proud of yourself that you've kind of made a human um, and that then you've raised humans and that then everything that your children do that you think is, is, is good or makes you proud you you feel like you've kind of done a good thing for the world and I think obviously my my family um my my sister who is really brave who has gone off to live in Australia and build a new life there you know she's very kind of courageous and independent my brother who has lived for the last 15 years knowing that his son is very slowly dying you know they're both really inspiring to me and uh, my parents as well but professionally I think um, I've worked with some really amazing people. 
um, having started the company with Mike, um, he was one of the early people in the FM market. He was one of the first people um, to do an MBA. You know, there were many universities that did MBAs. And uh, so I think it's good to work with people who are really smart because then you have to raise your game. And then we've been in an environment where um, we worked with all of those other FM people that I mentioned. Um, and funnily enough, actually people who commercially, I suppose, would have been my direct competitors. So people like Anne Lennox Martin, like Martin Picard. Um, we've actually all been working together in the same environment. Um, and people like David Emmanuel, who I've known for a long time, and we've always volunteered together in the professional bodies. There's a group of us that have known each other for a long time. And that even if we have been working in the same field in different organizations, personally, there's been a great deal of support there. And I have a network of um, FM friends, FM women, um, who we really, do support one another in our kind of aspirations and our kind of challenges so somebody like Kathy Haywood I've known for a long time um, and we've always been been close she's very inspiring she's gone from being editor of FM Worlds to uh, running Magenta and now to writing a novel which incidentally is fantastic absolutely brilliant piece of writing um, you know and people like um Kath Fontana and um, Katie Dowding and um, Charlotte Boval and Deborah Ward, Debbie Rowland, all of those women who have won lots of awards and achieved lots of things and have been prepared to be visible for the other women in the profession. So those women that I've listed have always been prepared to not just kind of go and win awards and be successful, but to spend 10 minutes on the phone helping someone else speak at an event, speak at a conference, be visibly there so that people can see what women are achieving. Mm. Beautiful. And so you have so much abundance and blessings in your life, Lucy. I just want that to continue and also a lot more people to come to your life and share. So I find the two questions. I mean, like, uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure, Lucy. Um, let's see, I think you've been in the industry for a long time and you have seen few things about the industry that's always been considered as this is how it works. So what is the, some of the common myths about our profession that you would like to debunk? Well, it's interesting. I used a phrase a long time ago um, where I said that FM was a Cinderella profession. Mm. And... I feel like that was very much misunderstood and that lots of people have said, oh, it's not a Cinderella profession. You know, we're not the kind of people, um, people under the stairs and, you know, we should be in the forefront and, you know, we're not these kind of second class citizens in FM. And I think that isn't what I meant. Um, I used it around the time of the millennium when everybody was having to work to, uh, see whether or not there would be this millennium bug and all the systems would stop. And what I mean by saying FM is a Cinderella profession is not to do with, you know, that it's just about cleaning and doing domestic work. That isn't what I meant at all. What I meant was, you know, the little bit where everyone else goes to the ball and Cinderella doesn't. Mm. And that that's what happens in FM is that everyone else in lockdown is at home making sourdough bread and learning new crafts. And the FM people are in the buildings, keeping them secure and catching COVID and doing all of the work that they can do in an empty building. And the FM people are running the ball while everyone else is going to the ball. And that's what I meant really, is that we are the people that are not up at the front doing the fancy stuff and that we make that happen for the other people. So it's not really about kind of being in rags and doing menial work. It's about not going to the ball mm. when everyone else is, because we have to support everyone else getting ready to go to the ball. And it's that part of the story that I really meant, you know? <laughs> now people know what, what you meant. Thank you for sharing. 
let's see i think you know what a what a beautiful journey so far um so, you know if somebody is looking to pursue a career similar to yours what advice would you give them other than keep pedaling <laughs> Um, keep pedaling absolutely anybody can have a career in FM it's a really welcoming sector there are opportunities for any talent to shine because what we're about in FM is being able to get things done and make things happen so if you are a person who likes being busy and you are able to talk to people and get stuff done or you are able to solve technical problems and get stuff done or you are able to um, develop some kind of new technology that will help people to get stuff done and get things sorted out. Um, anybody could build a career in FM. I'm a very ordinary person from a very ordinary background. And um, most of the people at the top of the profession also are. Um, you know, people that look like they have been exceptionally successful when you actually speak to them in these podcasts, you'll see that generally people will say, well, you know, I got a job and then I got another one and I just worked hard. There isn't some kind of magical success thing. Um, I think it's about being willing to work hard and develop your talents where they lie. And that's where FM is good because there are so many different opportunities that whatever strengths you have, you'll be able to make them sing out in an FM role. Well said, Lucy, well said. Lucy, we are at the end of the podcast. Is there any part of your life or career that we missed or is there anything else you would like to share in the last minute or two before we wind up the episode? Well, we haven't talked very much about the future and where we think FM is going. And of course, that's that's the great unknown because we don't really know what's going to happen about workplace occupancy and what's going to happen overall with the, the property market, how those occupancy levels are going to impact whether or not those patterns that we've had for over 100 years of everyone getting on the train, going to a city, working and coming back again. You know, in 10 years time, that might be quite different. We talk about activity based working as if it's a new thing. But if you go back to thinking about, I don't know, working on a farm before the Industrial Revolution, then in a farm, you have activity based working, you know, you make cheese in the dairy, you milk cows in the milking parlor, you have another area where the pigs are, and then in the farmhouse, you do the baking. Um, so we're already familiar with activity based working and having spaces for the different things we do. We just forgot that in that hundred year period where we developed the office. And before that, the hundred years previously, where we developed the factory. So it might be that this period of industrialized, focused working all in one place will turn out to be a bit of a kind of blip overall on the kind of broad spread of how things are. And that's what I'm interested to see in 10 years time. What is work going to be like and how different or similar will it be to work today? Wow. I think totally. I think when it comes to the future of FM or the future of workplace or the future of work in itself, there's a lot of ifs there, Lucy. I think all I tell people is it's a personal reaction to the change and it's a business reaction to the change. And in the, in the business, there are people who react to it differently. So let's just wait uh, for another, I think, COVID-19, as we call it, COVID-20, COVID-21, and now we're still in COVID-22. Fingers crossed that we won't use the word anymore. But thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy, for joining. Wish you. you everybody all the good health and happiness stay healthy continue to inspire everybody and i'm so looking forward to catch up with you face to face sometime yeah oh that'd be lovely well i'll see you at workplace features if i don't see you before definitely thank you lucy thank, thank you, you. bye-bye